So hi everyone, my name's Rob. I'm just going to talk to you today about my graduate experience so far at Network Rail. Just going to start off by giving you a bit of background to myself. So I began studying international business at Sheffield Hallam University. And then I um, completed a year in industry during this time at Network Rail in the Environment and Sustainable Development team as a project manager, and then went back to university and graduated in 2022. Before rejoining Network Rail again on the Business Change Graduate Scheme in September 2022. So since starting, I've completed my first six month placement within the Research Development and Innovation team, and I'm currently in my second placement with Systems Thinking. So this is one of the projects that I worked on for R&D. It's basically around being able to turn off the third rail in the station area. So the concept of the project is that when a train comes into the station area, uh, it will turn off third rail by going over a switch. And then when the train leaves the station area again, it will go over another switch and it will turn the third rail off, sorry. So when the train comes into the station area, it turns the third rail on, and when it leaves, it turns the third rail off. So the idea behind this project came from the ORR, who highlighted the risk of having a live third rail on in the station area. I started working on the benefit case when I was working on the project, and basically, I think network rail averages about three fatalities per year to do with the third rail in station areas. So hopefully as a result of this project, it'll reduce that and the injuries associated with it as well. Um, another benefit for this project is around further DC electrification. So hopefully with this switch, it will allow us to electrify the railway third rail electrification instead of OLE. So it's a bit of a more cost efficient way to electrify the railway. Um, it's worth saying the diagram on the screen is an outline proposal. The project's still in its feasibility stage, so they're working out the, the end solution still since I've left the project. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so I've just pulled up a few challenges that I've sort of noticed and faced since working in the railway for about eight months now. So the organisational structure was one of them. Network Rail is a federation of devolved businesses operating within a national framework. So what this means is each route has their own strategic business plan for the control period. Um, I found that it can be tricky working in this structure because it feels quite disjointed with routes and regions wanting one thing and maybe central function wanting another, or they both just don't know about what each other are doing. So it's, it can be complicated at times, I'd say, especially in R&D, I found this as well, because we'd have some projects nearing maturity and regions wouldn't know what projects were or and they're the customers for these projects at the end of the day. Um, so secondly, ownership and accountability. This again ties into the devolved working structure as well. So I found when I'm working on projects, it can be confusing at times who actually owns the work on the project, whether it's the regions and the routes or whether it's central function TA. So it's finding that balance and sort of making it clear to everyone who's involved in the project what their roles and responsibilities are. Um, and finally, implementing change. So one barrier to implementing change that I think I've noticed would be sort of change fatigue within Network Rail. We've had lots of programmes try and change and maybe they've not been quite so successful. So People now, when they hear change, are quite reluctant to get involved with it because they fear it's just going to be another change project that doesn't have much impact. 
And another barrier around implementing change, I would say, is the culture at Network Rail. We're quite, unless change is forced upon you, people don't really like to go out their way to implement change. There are exceptions, of course, people who pioneer change, but yeah, I'd say those two are some of the challenges around that. And finally, I'm just going to talk about some business opportunities. So GBR, as we know, GBR, TT coming in, working on Great British Rail. I think this is an opportunity for the business because they're pulling together all the relevant components under the same roof, if you like. So it's going to bring together track, train, stations and technology. So hopefully the decision making will be more in the interest of everyone rather than everyone trying to force their own um, decisions for their own interests. Um, second opportunity, I've touched on technology and innovation already, but I think there's the great, a great chance for us to sort of create more efficiencies and use technology and innovation more within the rail industry. Um, one example of that, I guess, would be um, tap in, tap out at stations in the tube now. So that's that's one little example of technology that is an efficiency saver. You've also got huge opportunities around like rolling stock. So, for example, Hydroflex is the UK's first hydrogen ready passenger train operating under electric battery and hydrogen power. So there's lots of sort of, there's a vast scope of improvements and areas that we can look to save in regards to technology and innovation, I think. And finally, a greener railway. So as I mentioned, I spent my year in industry in the environment and sustainable development team. So I saw a lot of the work that they're doing there with the decarbonisation strategy. And this one really, I think, I find it just quite exciting because there's going to be lots of change in the network over the over the next sort of 20, 30 years. So seeing how that develops and how we keep up with our competitors would be interesting. <coughs> and that's everything from me, unless anyone's got any questions. <coughs> Thanks, Rob. Anybody got any questions for Rob at the moment? Liam. Gosh. Um, so I was interested in what you said about the R and D, your time in R and D, um, and how you may do a project, do projects for a particular route or region, but then uh, or an innovation on a route or region. But that isn't always then necessarily easily translated to other regions because they they want different things. Is that what? You, is that what yeah. You're so saying? I think. Each project is different. So the one I worked on and talked about a bit there was working more specifically with Southern Region, an area, a specific area within Southern Region, I think it was, because they had DC on their patch. So it was brought there. I know Liverpool has some. So that solution wouldn't be for the whole network. That was particularly for the small areas. But I know other projects like one that Daisy's working on, um, it's trying to find the customers all from all the regions and get them bought into the projects. But I think maybe we do it too late in the process. Yeah, I was going to say, so what, what's your views on how to improve? Because I suppose you want to do an R&D project which meets a specific need for a specific customer, but you also, there's the central R&D team, and you, can, you need to kind of step back a little bit rather than ask, at what point can we make something that satisfies all of the regions, I don't know, it's, it's kind of making a very specific solution. Or yeah. you go, I think a bit more general, which is a bit more bang for the buck. How, how does that, is that a part of the I think, decision process? In the I think that will be uh, kind of above my pay grade, if you like. But, um, <laughs> the people who decide which projects will get taken on at the start, I guess, will get the say of uh, whether they want a wider project that covers everything or maybe one area, but I think R&D are trialling out uh, first-in-class deployment where they've got a team come in and sort of help support, get that initial deployment into one route and build up the benefit case around that one route. And then once they have that, they're hoping that the evidence will be there for the efficiencies so all the other routes 
won't really, and regions won't have a leg to stand on because hard evidence is there for them. But yeah, it's a bit of a tricky. And for say, if you do a project for a region, do all of the other regions get visibility of that, or would you have to kind of go and tell them what you're doing? And I think do the sales pitch to them. Yeah, we need to improve on that. I think. I think. I wouldn't be confident that that project I talked to you about today, other people know that that project's going on. Um, so I know we've got DC in Liverpool. So, <coughs> so yeah, I think we need to try and link in with the right people. I'd say not everyone, because people don't need to know, but the people who have our relevant need for our project that we're doing. And I think we need to link in with them earlier. Yeah. Thank you. Cheers. Question? Yeah. So now you've been through and you've done all of this work, if you, you can look back and you see everything you've done, if you could start again, would you make any different choices or what would you do differently? I'd be differently on the project. It's hard to say. I guess I'm still quite new, so understanding all the processes was the first time for me. I think I'd probably ask more questions at the start and it's having the confidence almost to talk up in those meetings where you've got your technical guys coming in and sort of questioning why, why we're doing it that way. But sometimes I think to myself, why have we done this? But I could have just asked on the call. So I think that would be the main one for me just to get the understanding of it. Yeah. Brilliant. <clears throat> Any other questions online? <coughs> All right. Okay, lovely. Shall I stop sharing yeah. them? Really great. Thanks. Um, thanks, Rob. I don't think you need to stop. stop. I think if Daisy just takes it over. I think it'll just jump in over to yourself then, Daisy, if you want to introduce yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Um, really appreciate it. So my name is Daisy Damon and I'm a recent project manager in research development. And I say recent because um, I was a graduate. I've been a project manager now for about three months and I'll go on to explain a little bit about my journey to be a project manager now. So this is a bit about me. I would first like to point out that I have been a student for longer than two years. Um, that kind of just starts at the university level. Um, I went to University of Buckingham, which is local to the Milton Keynes. Um, I wanted to get my degree done in two years as quickly as possible, get it over and done with and get out um, into a business and into the real world and see what it's like. Um, and I chose to do that via going to a project management graduate scheme. I didn't always know that I wanted to do project management, um, but I thought the skills lended itself quite well to who I am as a person. And I'll go on to talk a bit about that in a second. Um, but kind of the organisation of it, the time management, I thought that it would marry perfectly and I'm loving it so far. It's, it's brilliant. Um, and from that, I was a graduate for about 15 months. So I left the scheme a little bit early, um, but this opportunity came up to be in research and development, um, specifically within the track maintenance and plant programme. And I just jumped at the opportunity. Um, I knew that I was ready for a new challenge and um, that I wanted to push myself. I knew that being a project manager wouldn't be easy. Um, especially in the track maintenance and plant program. I don't have much experience in track maintenance and plant. It's a very new world to me, but it's one that I'm really interested in. Um, and it's fantastic to work in this space. Aside from that, um, a couple of other things is that I'm a DNI champion. I feel really passionately about DNI and network rail um, and in border industry. And I'm on the can do leadership team as well. So can do is our disability employee network. Um, and that has personal ties to myself. So for those that don't know me, or I haven't spoken to about this before. I'm actually autistic and I say that and sometimes it can make me go inside myself and you can become quite nervous when admitting that but in other times I'm really proud of it um, and people tell me it's something to be proud of all the time but actually when you face the challenges that I can face and I'm sure many of other people that I know with autism face it's difficult it's really difficult um, so I want to talk to you about diversity inclusion and network rail um, and the challenges that I've faced and what you can do to help me and people like me, because I think that's really important. That's why I'm here. I don't take the choice to kind of make myself vulnerable without seeing a benefit that it will help even just one person open up um, their minds to what it's like to live with autism or any other protected characteristics, for example. So there's nine protected characteristics that Network Rail focus on and that actually, in fact, everyone focuses on. 
and this kind of spurs on our Everyone Matters diversity and inclusion strategy. Now, that came about at the beginning of the control period, so about four or five years ago now. And it's, it is outdated. We've made significant strides to improve that and improve our diversity and inclusion in Network Rail. Um, that's, that can't be hidden, but actually how far have we come? That's the question. Yes, we've improved, but is it good enough? And that's something that we really need to tackle. So if we look at the start of CP6, 1.28% of people said that they were disabled in the business. That's now raised to approximately 3%. But actually, when we look at that, yes, it's good that it's, it's raised. And you'd look at that kind of black and white, it's raised. That's a good thing. We know that more people are declaring that they're disabled. But actually, when you compare that to against 14 million people in the UK being disabled, it's a fraction of that. And considering that we have 44,000 employees at Network Rail, we know that proportion is a lot higher. So almost 50% of people at the beginning of CP6 chose not to declare that they were disabled. But when we have discussions, actually telling the business that you prefer not to say is a better answer than saying nothing at all. Because at least then we know that you're not comfortable with it and we can make strides for improving that. Whether it's being more inclusive, whether it's pushing out campaigns about you know, what this means and how you do it. Um, and tackling some of the common misconceptions as well. So people might think, oh, I don't want to declare that I'm disabled because my line manager will see it. And if my line manager sees it, I might get discriminated against at work. And you might think, you know, someone that's not disabled, perhaps, that that doesn't happen. Well, yes, it does. And that's the problem. So we need to be tackling this. And that's why inclusivity is so important. But if we kind of focus on technical authority, we're making really big improvements um, against the business. So obviously, technical authority is, is, is a tiny portion of the business. It's, we've got multiple different functions. We've got franchised routes and regions. Um, but we're, we're above and beyond. <laughs> February um, of this year for race in band four, we were at the target of 14%. So we exceeded the targets of those in the Everyone Matters strategy. And that's the same for um, all bands. So if we go five to eight, and if we go on frontline workers as well. Now, if we look at gender, at the start of CP6, approximately 18% of workers were female and 82% um, were male. But actually, why is it split between male and female? Why don't we have people that are non-binary, for example? Why don't we have people that are transgender? And that was only four years ago that we had male and female. Four years ago, you'd expect something to be different by then. So maybe in CP7, we'll see that actually the gender categories of order, which would be a fantastic movement. And that kind of links into how it makes me feel. So how does diversity and inclusion at Network Rail make me feel? Well, if I link this back to my autism, I can feel quite isolated. People don't talk about their autism or people don't talk about their disability or that they're gay potentially. Um, and that can make it quite hard because on the surface, you can't see it. You might not be able to always see that someone's disabled. You might not be able to see that they're part of the LGBT community. So it can feel quite isolated unless people like myself have the courage to speak out and make themselves vulnerable, which is a really difficult thing to do. Um, even if you don't align with um, any of the protected characteristics in the sense that you are not gay or you're not disabled or you're not in the BAME category, there's still work for you to do to make people feel included. Um, and one example I love talking about with that is conversations with my dad. So my dad's a senior leader in a different company. Um, and he always used to talk to me about diversity and inclusion, and it was very evident to me that he just didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> to put it simply, he had absolutely no idea. Um, and I get that across different conversations I have. People saying, you know, why do people introduce with their pronouns or saying, you know, why does why do people do this or why do people do that? And it can be quite difficult. And I sat my dad down and I said, look, what is it that you struggle with? And he told me the challenges that he felt or the misconceptions that he had. And we went through them. And I ended the conversation by quite bluntly saying, you need to be better. I said to him, this is not good enough. You're a senior leader in a company. You have direct reports and you have this attitude. It needs to change. And I could have got away with that because I'm his daughter or potentially because I'm autistic and I can be quite honest. Um, it's a characteristic of mine that I'm quite proud of and I used to my advantage. Um, but he took that and now he does presentations about autism at work and about the impacts of stress. And he's just become an executive sponsor for diversity and inclusion in the company. And that makes me so proud. And that leads on to my next example there. So the emotion of being, of being proud, pride. 
I can feel really proud for a number of reasons. That can be for myself, being brave, having the courage, or that can be for others. So if I see someone making a stride, so I was in a um, technical authority GNI meeting, and someone said, hi, my name's so-and-so, my pronouns are they, them. And I thought, wow, that was really brave, really, really brave. And it wasn't brave because their pronouns are they, them. It was brave because they were the only person in the room that did that. So automatically it singled them out. They could have been a she, her, they could have been he, him, but the fact that they were the only person. And that's something that you can do to be more inclusive in your team meetings. So I can feel happiness as well. You know, I'm, I'm happy as I am. I don't want to change. I go through ebbs and flows of being really happy and proud that I'm autistic and it's part of my personality. It's who I am and kind of outside of work, I really use it to my advantage and I make it a strength. But also I can be really sad and find it really challenging. Um, and that's the brutal side of it. On the surface, I can seem like a really happy person and I am on the most part, um, but it is challenging and it does make me sad. And if we go on to the next slide, this is what you can do to help. So if I'm feeling isolated, be more inclusive. It's that simple. Be more <clears throat> inclusive. And you might ask, how can you do that? There are so many ways that you can do that. And you might say, I'm already inclusive. Well, you're, you might be, but there's always ways that you can be better. You can always be better. So like that person did in the DNI meeting, you can use your pronouns at the start of meetings. It might be completely out of the wild for you. You might have regular team meetings every week and you've never done it. Well, start doing it. It's not hard. If you know your pronouns and you're comfortable with your pronouns, lead the way. Some of you are line managers. You have, you have people around you. We talk to several people every single day. It's not hard to make a simple change like that. And again, that's very black and white thinking from me, but I really do believe that. It's a really simple change. Um, and if someone feels happy, champion them. You know, don't ruin their happiness. Empower that. And if someone feels pride in themselves, have pride in them. You know, they're proud for a reason. You should recognise that and be proud of them. If they're proud because they got out of bed this morning, don't go thinking, oh, well, we all get out of bed every day because we're all different and it's not that simple. So it's about recognising that and taking pride in ourselves and those around us. And that's really important. And that's what my dad's done. And it's made me even prouder. And if someone's sad, well, think, why are they sad? Have that emotional intelligence. What's going on in their life? If you're a line manager, you know, can you help them? And that's really important. And that links into empowering. You know, if they're finding it challenging, why are they finding it challenging? And what can you do to help them? You can be better. That's what you can do to help them. You can be better. And then again, about thriving. So make sure that people have the environment and the opportunity to thrive. That's really important. I've had that in some areas of my life and then some areas you've kind of been more closeted and you can't you can't thrive because you don't have the support around you. I can't thrive as an autistic person if day in, day out, I face half the challenges that I've had to face throughout my life. I just can't do it. How am I meant to be happy and be the best version of myself when it's when you're working in an environment that isn't inclusive, when your managers don't truly open their eyes to what it can be like? And that's what you can do. So thank you. That was a little bit about diversity and inclusion at Network Rail and my experiences um, as being an autistic project manager in technical authority. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, questions? Anybody got any questions? I've got one. So you mentioned diversity and inclusion. Yeah. It's obviously a very different environment here in Milton Keynes to when you go into the DUs. Yeah. How do you start getting the same message across there that you, I'm not saying have got across here, yeah. but is improving here? So I went on a shift recently in one of my projects, Felix, and I was in, um, and I won't name a shame, but you get comments, even just names like, oh, thank you, love, or thank you, dear. And it's just, I know that sounds like a really silly thing, but would you say that to your section manager who's a male? Probably not. So it's derogatory, um, and I don't like it. I'm not, I'm not your love, I'm not your dear, and that really frustrates me. And it's about challenging people. So you have to be strong to do that. And not everyone is, but it's about making sure that people understand that they, they will be challenged. I know that I'll be challenged on some things. There's some things that I need to improve at because everyone can be better. Um, but actually, it's about challenging. So I said to that person, I was like, oh, I don't really like being called love. And you don't have to say it in a really blunt way. You don't need to be angry about it. But actually, facilitating that conversation changes behaviours in places like DUs. And that's the most important thing. 
Can I make an observation? I think Jane's got something on there. In asking the question, you'd said, how do you? And it's actually, how do we? Mm. Because this isn't her problem. Yeah. It's our problem. Yeah. And the only way the only way that this is going to change in DUs, if we perceive DUs to be a bigger problem, is where we all play a role yeah. in changing their behaviour. Um, there's too many times we 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 will put uh, the exclusion at the feet of the people excluded, yeah. rather than thinking, what are we doing to facilitate them coming through the door? Yeah. And that's a really good point, because can you imagine for me going on a 12-hour shift, how exhausting it is to travel two hours down to that area, then do a 12-hour shift, then travel two hours back? That's hard enough as it is. When you add on being autistic and you've got that added mental fatigue and kind of masking your autism in front of a crowd that you don't know, and then you've got on top of that people making comments like that and you having to bat them away, it is exhausting. It's absolutely exhausting. And if you can do something like that and take the responsibility and accountability for your own words and your own actions, that makes my life easier. Got one online from Gareth. Yeah. Hi, Daisy. No, great presentations. Thank you. Daisy, I really like your challenge that we need you know, we challenge ourselves to be better from a personal perspective and from an organizational perspective. Yeah. Isn't that where we're looking at anywhere that you know is leading are we leading the way in diverse, diverse and inclusion, sort of the direction we're going, the, the pace we're going? Are there others that do it better? Are we looking at them, do you think? Seriously? In terms of the business or technical authorities of function, for example? Uh, a bit of both, I suppose. What do, what do you think? On the surface, we are a disability confident leader, we being Network Rail. We have won awards for our LGBT commitments. We've got, uh, I think it's seven employee networks. So on the surface, we're leading the way. But actually, if you granulate that, there's a lot of work to do. And that's like us. So I kind of imagine the people in this organisation to be like little ants. Um, there's so many of us, but we can all have a massive impact on each other. And the way I was talking to my dad about this, actually, and I was like, if you see a trail of ants, you'll see they carry big leaves and they've got a big burden on their shoulders. That's how I feel. And there's other ants that are trailing behind or actually probably in front and they're not carrying the leaves. Um, and when you put it like that, there's a lot of work left to be done. And yes, some other organisations are, are doing really well and probably doing better, but there's also people doing worse. And it's about taking the lessons from those that are doing really well and learning from those that aren't. Why aren't they doing well? What is it that they haven't done? And then if they are doing well, what is it that we need to do more? And it's all well having accreditations and awards, but actually what does that mean in practice and how do your employees feel? That's the most important thing. So if we take the Your Voice survey, for example, that's going around, that is an opportunity for us to express our honest thoughts. But how many questions in that are linked to diversity and inclusion? Not many. Not many, so no, I was, I was reflecting on that, and yeah, is it a missed opportunity for us then to, to really get that feedback from? I think so because yeah. we're a we're a safety critical organisation, right? Not every organisation is safety critical, so that's fair enough. You know, I get that there might not be loads of questions about safety, but every single organisation in this in this world have a responsibility for diversity and inclusion. Yeah. Every single organisation. So if that's the forefront of many different organisations, how come we aren't pushing it more? Yeah. Thanks, Daisy. Thanks, Gareth. You. We've got another one online from Colin, and I'll come to you afterwards, Lee. Hi, Colin. Hi, Daisy. Um, <coughs> I do sit on the spectrum, um, so so you're not alone in this particular meeting. The, I suppose, the, one question would be, have you ever read a book by, called by Matthew Side called Rebel Ideas. I haven't, no. It's it's worth getting a copy. It's about diversity and inclusion, but also having diversity in thinking. So in terms of not necessarily neurotypical or neurodiverse, but having get it getting everything in. And I think as as a business, yes, we 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 are we we do tick. Uh, and side is spelled S Y E. D or SD, Yeah, I was anyway. just noting it on my phone. Yeah. Um, I think that as a business, yes, we, we, we tick the boxes. I think there's a large amount of focus on 
certain areas that particularly large organisations, government organisations get monitored on. But I think when it comes to neurodiversity, I think it does less well. I, yeah. I sit I sit within system operator. I'm a operational train planner and there's a large number of my colleagues and it is recognized as a, as a, as a role that is quite suitable for people who have a particular yeah. um, mindset. And we're better at we, we, we're slowly getting better at recruiting and we're slowly getting better at dealing with sort of the fallout if people do have issues. Yeah. Um, but we're not very good at actually helping our line managers recognize when people are about to fall off the perch, as it were. Um, and I think if can do and and perhaps you and I should have a coffee and put the world to rights. Um, but it's right. it's it's it, it, it's it, it's 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 work in progress. Yeah. But I think sometimes our line managers get the expectation of what they can do is so much that they don't have time to remember it all. You know, it's not something that's necessarily there all the time in, in any type of diversity, um, most of all on, on the autistic spectrum. But we can we can say we can talk about that another time. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah, but but thank you. Thank you for the scene. Thank you for sharing. I know my I know some of our colleagues. Our female colleagues are getting late diagnosis again because they've been masking and I think that's something that that needs to be the business needs to work at understanding and allowing people to say I am. Yeah, but thank so you. So thank you for today. Thanks Colin. You've touched on a really big point there about females and masking. Um, and when I come into the office, I step through the doors and I never subcon I never consciously say, oh, Daisy, you're in the office now. You've got to pretend to be normal is what I say to myself. You know, it just happens. Mm. It does just happen. And people kind of meet me outside the office and I'll be in my home environment. I'll be comfortable. I'll be wearing shorts because I don't like the feeling of trousers on my legs and things like that. It's just small changes like that when I'm at home. And I'm myself. I am my true self at home. And I can dance around because I'm excited and I'm going to Lisbon at the weekend. I can start clapping my hands because I've seen something funny on the TV. But if I dared clap my hands randomly in a meeting, someone would be like, Who is she, what is she doing? What is she doing? They just People just don't have that understanding. So I'm forced to mask. And it, it for me, it doesn't affect me because I, um, I feel like I'm a strong person. Um, and... It's not like I go home and I'm like, oh, that was a tiring day. I've had to mask all day because it just happens. It just happens naturally, which is a shame. It's a big shame. And it means that people don't don't get diagnosed um, and potentially they can't be their true self at work, which is not how it should be at all. Um, but actually, when people do get the diagnosis, it can unlock a, a whole new world, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. I often say to my parents, I feel like I've got more autistic since I was told I was autistic. But that could be because it's recognised and I'm not that troublemaker and I'm not just someone that's clapping randomly. I am actually autistic, so now I can be myself because people know I'm autistic. So there's pros and cons of a diagnosis. Um, and it's definitely harder when you're a female because it's it's often identified a lot later. Um, so that was a great point to raise. Thank you, Colin. We'll yeah. definitely put the world to rights over a coffee. Yes. Uh, are you in Milton Keynes all the time or just... Most of the time, yeah. Most of the time, Two, three okay. days a week, so yeah. I'll, Drop I'll, me a message and we'll go for a coffee. We'll, we'll, we will do. Take care. Yeah. I'll, I'm going to have Colin. to go soon, but thank you for today. Thanks, Colin. Thank you, thank, and thank you to both, both of you. It's been really interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. I think Liam had a question. Yeah, thanks, Daisy. Um, it was it's more of an observation, really, but I'm keen to get your thoughts on the kind of the sticky minefield of challenging people. And mm -hmm. I, I was just thinking Network Rail have kind of quite lots of tools and processes in place if you want to challenge somebody on safety for example yeah, yeah. We've got safety conversations we've got work safety procedures um but in terms of challenging somebody on something they may, they may have said to you that, mm -hmm. that isn't particularly inclusive that's a whole other minefield yeah. and you want you need to do it in a way that you want to try and get the best outcome for the person being challenged but also yeah. the challenger as well yeah. and um do you feel there's enough I'm not saying process, but do, do you feel that you've got enough tools or network rail have the right kind of toolkit available and it's widely known for to, to, for people to make those challenges and receive the challenges as well? I do, but I think I come from a different perspective in that I'm a young female. I'm already at a disadvantage. 
and then when I have to challenge someone that perhaps has more authority will definitely have more experience than me that's where it comes really hard um, and I think there's a number of tools and resources that people can give you but actually it's about having that inner strength to say actually that's not right and with safety for me it's it's black and white in the fact that it's either safe or it's not whereas diverse in my opinion whereas diverse inclusion is a lot more in that gray area so some people might not have a problem with it but actually I have a problem with it and it's about people recognizing that whilst it doesn't offend that person the person that I'm talking to about this is offended what do I need to do so challenging is really important but also that um awareness of knowing what you should and shouldn't say what you should and shouldn't do because the person that's offended shouldn't always have to be the one that's challenging you should challenge yourself if I could add to that yeah I think it's also worth remembering that in my opinion a DNI challenge is also a safety challenge because if yeah. someone feels uncomfortable to express who they are and come up with their own opinions and thoughts and feelings while they're at work they have to be inside of themselves they may end up sad and they may end up doing things in an unsafe way just because they're so focused on how they're feeling so in my opinion a DNI challenge can also be a safety challenge you don't have to separate them on that vein that's a really good point really good point and, and that's been part of the point of some of the recent safety briefing as well. But I, I, th I think from some of the things that you were talking about in terms of uh, autism and masking actually goes much, much broader, because if you take diversity and inclusion much more broadly, mm -hmm. how many, many people feel that they're having to mask in other ways? Yeah. And it, yeah. it, it may not be the same challenge in the same way for you, but if you're hiding your gender, if you're hiding, yeah. if, if you're having to um, do something different around your religious beliefs, just fit into yeah. this organisation, it's all going to be taking a toll. And, and I think it was very specific to you. I think it's indicative of what happens for everybody else in yeah. a differing way when we're not inclusive in the right ways. Yeah, I agree. And masking is commonly associated with autism, but actually you're right in that different people for various different protective characteristics can be masking. Um, and that's something that if they're choosing to mask because they want to, that's their decision. But if they're choosing to mask because they feel they have to, yeah. that's when it's yeah. a problem. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big difference, I think. Is there any other questions online? No, not at all. Nobody does know. Thanks, okay. everyone. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was two amazing <laughs> presentations. Um, you know, really, really great. You know, we think we've got this organisation which is there to deliver for the customer, and we we've designed the best organisation. And just coming in, Rob, you know, for a, for a very short period of time, coming in and looking and giving us some honest feedback about that, and telling us really, you know, we need to have another look. Because we, you know, well, um, for all the reasons you said, you know, I think it's really, really true and it's powerful to, you know, have that set of eyes and tell us what, uh, you know, what's what's really going on rather than what we think is the, is the best. And, um, yeah, Daisy, every, every time I hear your, um, you speak, I, I, you know, I want to be a better DNI champion. So, you know, if, every time you, you do it. So thank you very much, both of you. We can thank them in the normal way. So, you know, anything else? I think that brings us to a close, doesn't it? Yes, I believe it does. Anybody online? Any AOB? Not for myself, no. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for your time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Any of you want to pop down and eat some of the yeah, sandwiches? Yeah, anybody wants the sandwiches? <laughs> pop in the milk. Milk. Cheers. <laughs> 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 Uh, really well done, guys. Thank you. Really well okay, I think all the questions showed up. Well, that's I think one of the questions, Daisy. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, uh, it was.